Good afternoon, everyone. I am David Dinayon, the interim president of the Association of Physics Students in Mindanao and a proud volunteer of the Physics Meetup. I will be your host for today. On behalf of the organizing team, I welcome you all to the Physics Meetup, studying communication patterns using mobile phone data with our guest, Dr. Mikaela Irene Fodoli. For this session, we are proud to partner with several amazing communities, namely Pinoy Scientists, Earth Shaker, Western Mindanao State University Physics Student Society, Central Mindanao University Science Education Society, Mindanao State University Main Campus Society of Physics Students, the Kapisana ng mga mag-aaral sa Pisika of MSU Iligan Institute of Technology, Caraga State University's Society of Physics Students. We also have University of Science and Technology in Southern Philippines Physics Department, the Einstein Society from Philippine Normal University, Mindanao, Central Mindanao University Physics Society, and last but not the least, Bukidnon Physics Society. Thank you for partnering with us in making physics both inclusive and inspiring. Allow me also to go through today's program briefly. First, we will have our opening remarks, followed by the introduction of our guest speaker, who will then give us a short talk, followed by an open forum, a response from a select participant, and then the closing remarks. We hope that you stay with us until the end so that we could wrap up our session with a group photo and then brief networking. So, without further ado, may I call on the founder of the amazing platform, who just celebrated their first anniversary last Wednesday. We know Earth Shaker, so let's welcome the Earth Shaker himself, Mr. Ralph Abainza, for the opening remarks. And so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Fadoli. Good, uh, good afternoon, Ms. Adele. Good afternoon, David, and to all our participants. Um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be with here to be here with you today. And thank you for the happy birthday song earlier. We really appreciate that um, happy birthday cake and song. And to give you a short introduction of what Earthshaker is, um, we will be, I'll be sharing screen, a very, very short presentation about what Earthshaker is. Um, can you see the slide? Yeah, so, so Earthshaker, um, is an organization that was founded last year and we just celebrated our first year anniversary last October 7. Earthshaker is a non-stock, non-profit, youth-led science organization that aims to shake. So hence the, the name Earthshaker. Though some of the people actually thought that Earthshaker came from, from a Dota player or Dota um, character, but no, um, Earthshaker is independent of itself. Um, we really targeted to, to shake the appreciation of Earth sciences in the society and to push for a culture of having science-based decisions. Our main scopes are meteorology, astronomy, geology, environment, and life sciences. The social media page has been active earlier in, to, in 2019, but the organization was officially or the page officially transitioned into an organization last October 7. And from its establishment last October 7, the organization already is, um, remains committed to bringing the earth sciences to the Filipinos through value, various online and offline forms. And our main, um, our main initiatives is to are to make people-centered and easy to understand social media posts. Hence, kaya po um, lumaki yung social media reach namin. In the span of less than a year, the, uh, the figures were taken last August. So in the span of less than a year, we already garnered nearly half a million 
um, Facebook page like 65.7 thousand Twitter followers and 6.3 thousand Instagram following. The main post of Earthshaker revolve around the various coverages on earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, typhoons, astronomical events, and environmental issues. So we really aim to use social media as a tool to make people more aware about different earth science topics. And our average monthly reach is 27.6 million. So that's somehow comparable to different as or different news sites already. And aside from that, aside from the online platform, most people actually thought of us as, an, as just an online platform, but we are more than just an online page. We, um, we coordinate or we, we are coordinating with different organizations, different activities, and we also conduct different offline activities. Hence, our main vision of Earth Sciences with the people. So, kapag po with the people, we always try to put into perspective that Earth Sciences should not be just uh, should not be just seen as for the intellectuals or just sitting in its ivory tower. So we are always trying to integrate with the people and with the community. So we, uh, we conduct um, donation drives, we conduct different out-of-town activities, um, seminars, and our largest event so far is the free telescope viewing and earth science session held at the revolving tower in Pasig City last March. That was attended by Mayor Vico Soto and many of the citizens in Pasig City. So given the earth sciences with the people, we are really happy that the local government units are actually recognizing the efforts of the organization. Even though we are limited in resources and it's just really focused on purely volunteer-based activities, we are very happy that we are making an impact in the Filipino society. The Earth Shaker um, will remain committed in its first anniversary, um, even in the coming years. We'll remain committed in serving the nation through information. So here are some of our social media and email um, accounts if you have any queries and if you want to collaborate. So again, thank you for, um, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share what Earth Shaker is and um, we will. We are looking forward for the talk of Dr. Fodolig later because um, it's really an interesting topic amidst the pandemic. We all know that the um, the use of mobile phones, the use of social media in different plat in different online platforms are now more prevalent than before the pandemic. So again, thank you very much and good afternoon to all. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for that opening remarks, Mr. Ralph Abainza. Now let's welcome um, Mr. Jake Destacamento, Ambassador of Teach Philippines Incorporated to introduce our guest speaker. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor and pr privilege today to introduce to you our uh, speaker for this uh, physics meetup. Our speaker for today is a Filipino physicist and a former child prodigy. In June 2020, she was cited as the top 50 child prodigies in the world by the World Creative Science Academy. As a child prodigy, she is known for starting her undergraduate degree at the age of 11, where she began her university education at the University of the Philippines, Diliman without a high school diploma and without taking the UP college admission test. In 2007, at 16 years old, our speaker graduated with a bachelor's degree in physics, summa cum laude, from UP Diliman, with a general weighted average of 1.099, earning her as the class valedictorian. Right after her undergrad, she joined and later earned her Master of Science degree in Physics and her PhD from UP Diliman. She later on became a Fulbright Scholar for Doctoral Enrichment in Behavioral Economics at the University of California, Irvine, USA. She joined 
UP Diliman as an instructor, then later on became as assistant professor at the Ateneo de Manila University. She is currently is a postdoctoral researcher at the Asia Pacific Center for Theoretical Physics in South Korea under APCTP Young Physics Scientist Training Program, where her current works involve complex, complex systems and network science, inferring social relations from call details record. Please help me welcome our uh, speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Mikaela Irene Podelik. A virtual round of applause, please. Hi, ma'am. Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Jay, for that introduction. Um, and thank you all for coming today. So let me just start my presentation. Um, I'll just share my screen. Uh, I think it's this one. Can you now see, what can you see now? I think this is, uh, oh, okay, I think it's a different. Sorry, what can you see, Adele? Do you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. 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 Great. So, just remove the annotations. Okay. Great. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, I'll be presenting today um, about using mobile phone data to study um, communication patterns. Um, but uh, before I begin the actual talk, uh, let's begin first with some background. Um, first about me. So Jake has um, given a very flowery introduction of what I have done in the past, but I want to focus more on like the technical um, in the, the objective aspects. So I have a background in physics taken all my degrees from the National Institute of Physics uh, at uh, the University of the Philippines in Diliman. And although I have always been in physics, I've always been interested in interdisciplinary work. So what is interdisciplinary? So what, um, what that means is you, you, I, I, um, you're looking at topics or problems where you don't need just physics, but you need an understanding of several other fields. And in these kinds of projects, uh, you usually need a collaboration um, between different um, uh, people with different backgrounds, like biology, economics, mathematics, and so on. So this has always been my, my interest. And uh, back then, when I was in undergrad, I worked, for example, on what we call language competition. And then I moved to more theoretical aspects for my PhD. And now I'm back to this interdisciplinary work where I work with data and uh, computer scientists as well. Now I have worked uh, as an instructor um, and an assistant professor both at UP and Ateneo, but I've also worked in the industry, which has given me also like a different flavor, for example, of what you can do with a physics degree. And now I have. Um, I have returned to academia. I am now working as a postdoctoral fellow at APCTP, where I work in complex systems in data science. So maybe, I, I don't know how, uh, if you can all turn on your, your, your mic, uh, let me see if I can. How many of you are familiar with this? Complex systems in data science? So I'm just gonna give a brief introduction of, of, of what these things are later. So, as I said, uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow, and I just want to show you this diagram of uh, what career paths in the sciences generally look like. So, I think that many of you are um, um, teachers, students, all in the sciences, or interested in it in some way. And this is in general like how it works. So, usually you start as an undergrad. Can you all, um, Adele, can you see my mouse? Okay. So you start um, as an undergrad, and then you know some people work directly, like in some science-related field or even non-academic work. And then some people decide to uh, undertake further studies. So that's your master's, um, after which you can also work, or you can go straight to PhD, where the focus is less on academics but now more on research. So you want to like learn uh, how how to discover new things instead of just 
studying what has already been known. So uh, after taking your PhD, you can again decide whether to go to non-academic work, uh, which in my case, for example, like I could go work as a data scientist if I wanted to. Um, and in fact, back in back, I think a few years ago, I was working at EDC, Energy Development Corporation. I, they have a plant at Mount Apple, I believe. And uh, for during that time, I was straight out of my PhD and I was working on um, geophysics plus some business things. So it's possible. You can actually move out of academia at any time, or you can keep on going through this academic direction. Uh, after PhD, you can go back to postdoc where you just do more research uh, with more money and less stress. So, and then eventually the aim is either, you know, go to back to non-academic work or become a professor where you do research, you teach, and you supervise students. So if you're interested in how things work in the sciences, like this is generally how it is, but I just want everyone to know that, you know, when you undertake graduate studies, for example, it doesn't really restrict your options. Um, as long as you develop more and more skills, you can always have flexibility of where you want to work as long as you're happy with it. So a huge part of postdoc training is actually collaborating with others. And working in an international institute actually helped me um, develop collaborations, not just with um, Filipinos, but also with um, scientists from abroad. Uh, and here are some of them. So I have worked with um, a professor in Finland and um, uh, uh, his postdoc and his former student. And um, Professor Hang Hyun Jo actually used to work in the same institute as I do, like APCTP. And actually, he was a former postdoc of Professor Kim Okaski. So this kind of networking actually um, is very helpful when you do research um, uh, in your career. So just a background of uh, where I am working at the moment. So I work at the Asia Pacific Center for Theoretical Physics, and um, we're a very uh, we are we have we work on different things. Uh, so this is a new set of people. And my former collaborator has already left. Um, we have people who are working on string theory, cosmology, um, condensed matter, um, statistical physics, and so these are like the more senior postdocs who are in between postdoc and professor. And here are like some of the more, the more junior researchers. And then as you can see, I'm here. I'm also with another Filipino, um, Professor Carlos Baldo of Mapua University. Uh, so yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's been a good experience. If you are thinking of taking a PhD or if you're thinking of going for a postdoc, I really highly recommend it. Um, going abroad for this training really open up, you know, a lot of per, um, how, how do I say this? Um, a lot of opportunities and also help me really like, you know, get better at research. So um, as I said, I will discuss a little bit about complex systems and uh, data science. So what is complex systems actually? So complex systems is a field of study uh, that is interdisciplinary. So the aim is to look at complex interactions between entities. That's basically it, but it has a lot of subfields. And if you've heard of fields like, for example, biophysics or econophysics, most likely like the studies that you will encounter will all involve complex systems um, in some way. So to give you an example of what complex systems are, I have here um, some videos, which we're working earlier, but I think we need time to load. Ah, okay. So let me just share the audio. Okay, great. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise round at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backwards around the track like a shock wave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backwards at about the same speed. So um, that was a short clip and basically it was about how, I'm not sure if you have 
encountered this, but sometimes you have these traffic buildups and then, you know, when you get to this point where traffic goes away, you wonder why was there traffic in the first place? Like there's, there is no accident. I don't see anything wrong. So this is like one of the models that have been used to explain that. And the reason why it's interesting is because, you know, each car has a single purpose. It just wants to go forward. It just wants to go forward as fast as possible. But if you look at the interactions between them, if you have different cars which are thinking the same thing, you actually get a different kind of behavior. And, and you, you, you see all these patterns that emerge from so individual to group behavior. Another example is um, if you've seen a flock of birds fly in the sky, uh, it looks something like this. <laughs> is that these look like very interesting patterns like huge ones but if you if you examine this whole thing that's moving they're actually just you know birds that fly and each one has of course they, they don't know that they're going to move in this way they just know who's in front of them who's behind them like they and they shouldn't really be bumping into each other but these seemingly simple individual behavior also creates an emergent behavior which is very different from what you see at the individual level so that's what comedy is, is about you have um individual behavior you have individuals and they interact with other individuals and then when you look at the interactions you see something interesting you see something different and it's usually very complex so it sometimes cannot or most of the time cannot be modeled like exactly with simple equations but you need like more complicated ways to analyze them now it's not just about so, so far I'm just looking at like movements and patterns, but it also involves like things like networks, for example. So this is a I believe this is a collaboration network. So if uh, these are different authors who have co-written papers with other authors, and if you map the networks, you will find okay you have like a community here and a community here, which is not very obvious if you don't really look at the network. So if you look at if you just do a manual count in Excel, for example, who did this with whom, it's not very easy to see. But having something like this, a visualization and corresponding metrics, will allow you to see more about the structure of the network that emerges again from the individual interactions. Also, for example, the, the financial markets is also an example of complex systems. So here you have buyers and sellers who all just want to make money. So how do their interactions like create crashes or bubbles or things like that? And, and there has been a lot of studies in trying to predict to some extent um, stock market prices. So th these are all examples of complex systems, but actually there are a lot more examples. Um, you have um, neurons, for example, uh, what else? You have biophysics, you have um, uh, for different levels, ecology, for example, all of these things involve competition in some way, which is why it's a very interesting and, and highly interdisciplinary um, topic of research. So, I, as I said, I am working at, as a postdoc in computer systems and data science. Um, but so now I want to talk about that. So what is actually data science? So this is a huge, uh, this is a big buzzword nowadays, and you've probably heard it some way or another. Um, and there actually isn't a very clear, you know, definition of, you know, of what data science is. But in a, in a nutshell, it's just extracting useful information from data. Now I am. Um, when you say data, probably you think, you know, X and Y in a table, but sometimes it's not like that. Uh, data can be in many forms. It can be unstructured. It can be structured. Like, for example, um, what we're doing now on Zoom, whom we are meeting, like the sites you visited on Google or YouTube, all of these, they're all data. And, and it's, it's and with the advent of big data, um, you have lots of data, lots of information, and you have to know how to process them. So that's all part of like data science. Um, having how to work with data and how to extract information from them. And to do that, you usually need like these three things. Um, you need, of course, some knowledge of the domain. Uh, this could be, for example, business. Um, these are, you know, the business people, you know, what do they want? Um, in, where I worked before in geothermal energy, um, they want, they, for example, they knew about how, how geothermal wells work. 
that's considered the domain expertise. Uh, computing, um, computer science. So uh, computer science people uh, are not just programmers, they actually do a lot of things, so computational stuff. And then you have math, uh, of course, which is actually, these two are very um, related to each other. And if you've heard of machine learning, that's kind of what it, what it is. You have, uh, um, you try to use math and try to use it on like big problems, for example, like self-driving cars, race regulation, those kinds of things. And data science involves like all of these in order again to extract useful information from data using math, statistics, and domain expertise. And it's not just in academia, like the, if you probably heard of data science, it's probably about business, right? So for example, um, if you have shopped on Amazon, they have these recommended for you products, right? Or Shopee or Lazada. Um, those aren't taken at random. Those were carefully selected so that it, it, the likelihood of you seeing something you would like to buy is actually higher. So that just, just that recommended list is actually like a product of data science or in YouTube, for example, they have these recommended videos, right? That's also part of it. Or in Facebook, for example, um, you know, friends you may know, or you know, these um, tagging, uh, photo tagging. So sometimes you get recommendations. Do you know who this person is, or is this person you? And you're like, oh, how do they know that my, my face is there? So this is all like part of this um, general idea. Essentially, as I said, it's just extracting useful information from data, which is usually very messy and like huge. So. I have talked about computer systems, I have talked about data, and now I want to talk about what I have done so far, which is working with um, mobile phone data. So, if I'm not sure if you are aware of this, but just by having a smartphone, you're actually giving a lot of people a lot of information about what you do. And this has actually been a, a, a big issue the past few years, like with these the scandals, the Facebook scandals, um, and so on, these privacy issues, that they're collecting more information than, than what you think you are giving. But in any case, this is what you probably are giving away just by using a phone. First of all, your location. So if you have a GPS, um, if you have a GPS function on your phone, that gives like wherever, I mean, to, uh, that, that gives um, your phone idea of where you are. And if you use that with your app, then it tells the app where you are. And this is why, you know, on Twitter, you have these geo tag tweets, right? So they tell you like wh where, where you were, um, you know, when you had, when you posted this, this tweet. Now, even if you have a, um, a, a feature phone uh, and you don't have this GPS function, you still are giving away your location because you have cell towers and, the mobile telecom provider, of course, knows which cell towers you're using and where that cell tower is. To some extent, though, it can provide like, okay, around which location is this person using his or her phone? So that's one. Um, another thing is using a mobile, uh, what, what, I'm sorry, social networking um, applications like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So when you are on Facebook and you add a friend that tells Facebook that, okay, these two persons must have some sort of relationship. And like you, it depends on what you post. You can even tell Facebook that this, this person is your boyfriend or your mother or whomever. And that information is actually used by Facebook and you know, all the other apps that buy in, uh, that, that uses information as well. Same thing with Instagram or Twitter. Uh, shopping behavior is also there. So if, if you have tried Facebook marketing, they will kind of have this option where, are you looking for people who recently purchased something? So all of these things, everything that you do with your phone actually involves some information about your behavior or about your information. Um, communi uh, messaging apps. So every time you, you, you don't just go around sending messages to everyone unless you're a spammer, you usually tend to send messages to certain people. And the more often and the more regularly you send, um, you call or text or send chats or Skype with these people, the more likely that you know you are actually have a connection or relationship. And everything, again, as I said, you kind of, it, it, it's in your phone data. And also search information, you know, what, videos you have watched, um, where have you been, 
all these things. So these are all data that are taken using your phone and depending on the privacy agreements that you have signed, they may actually be given to you know different companies who want to use them for business purposes or to professors who want to use them to study human behavior like the people I have worked with in Finland. And in particular for today, I am going to discuss how we have used mobile communication to study um, human communication patterns. Just as a, a, um, a, well, not a disclaimer, but oh, <laughs> clarification, um, the data set that I have worked with is anonymized, which means that you know you don't have to worry about people tracking you down. Usually when companies give this away, they try their best to anonymize um, this information. So in particular, um, uh, I, I worked with call detail records. So these are calls and SMS records, which include um, details about when the calls were made, how long the calls were, um, was it a caller and SMS, these kinds of things. And although this is kind of archaic nowadays, because now you have a lot more messaging apps, back then um, when this data set was taken, uh, so 2008, 2009, it was before the advent of WhatsApp. And, 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 and all these messaging apps. So if you actually consider mobile communication back then, it was almost exclusively calls or SMS. And the nice thing about it is you only have to get it from one single company. And once you get that data, then that kind of gives you an accurate picture of what mobile communication is. The interesting, uh, the, the, also the, um, the best thing about digital records is that it suffers from it does not suffer from what we call recall bias so what is recall bias now normally um you can also address the same thing by asking you in a survey okay um whom did you call uh, the past month what how often did you call them what times do you call them of course it's very hard to remember what things you did like how, how many times did i text this person or that person but if you have the records itself then it's like an accurate picture of what really happened like that makes it a very rich source of information so what can we do with call detail records? Now, if you know who called whom, what time, where, and so on, you have an idea of the social network. So who are connected to whom? Um, who's friends with whom? Um, who's likely the mother, the father of this person? Uh, we know that uh, we can infer um, and we can actually derive something like this social network structure, which has been shown to be uh, a good, um, a good uh, estimate of or approximation of the actual social network um, of, of, of the subscribers. Also where you go. So as I said, even pre-GPS time, you have cell tower locations. And if you have a very regular schedule, just looking at your call detail records, you can also um, kind of infer what you do. So this is um, an actual pattern from a single user in some study where they found that this person stay, uh, has more activity in, um, in, uh, in the office on Mondays at home. And these office home and rest, these aren't like known locations. They kind of inferred this from the um, cell tower location. So for example, here you see that you have a high activity in the blue line from Mondays to Fridays, which goes down on weekends. And then the red line somehow is more constant than the blue line. So that's how they infer that, okay, um, the blue line is probably the something you do Mondays to Fridays, could be office, school, the red one is something which you, you know, where you go to pretty, like on a regular basis, which is your, probably your home. And then you have here, um, I think these are periods of inactivity or risk. So all these can be inferred from like just, you know, call detail records and not even talking about apps or, or all that stuff. So a lot of things can be inferred um, from these. And also some data sets um, include information about who you are. Of course, not your name, but they include your gender or your age. Uh, in some cases, there are family plans. So you can actually track which, which subscribers are linked to the main subscriber. And of course, you don't just pay for anyone. So these likely are your friends or your family members. So, there are a number of different kinds of call detail records. Uh, each data set is unique, so it depends on the place, for example, depends on what kind of data the company gave them. Um, so I'm gonna show you uh, what most, what other data sets have. So the very uh, basic ones contain just two things, um, records of 
calls SMS and when they were made. Some data sets, um, what happened? Sorry, sorry. Okay, some include um, latitude longitude, um, date and call, but no call records, uh, sorry, no caller information. So these are often used to study mobility pattern. So for example, if you want to study uh, where people are, you know, busiest, then you can actually use this kind of data set. Uh, sometimes you have caller ID, um, caller information plus their age and gender. So this one you can use to kind of track individuals. Like since I know that he's 2132 and I know um, uh, this, uh, her age and gender, then I can, I can check like what happens to, to, to 2132 over time. And what we have though is a combination of all these. So this is a data that I've worked, uh, I've worked with. Uh, we have the time of calls, the, whether it's a call or an SMS, caller ID, callie ID, the location of the caller at any given time, and the age and gender of the caller and callie. And we have this for millions of users, actually um, it, uh, technically 1.5 million, but we have more where the age and genders are not known. So what we have are anonymized individual tracking from for two straight years, January 2008 up to December 2009. And the nice thing about having a two-year data set is that you can actually see what these people were doing over a span of two years. We also know their demographics. We also know their location. And we also know, you know, whether it's a call or SMS, these kinds of things for 1.5 million users. And this is an example of what you would call um, big data. So actually, when I, when I work with this, this is a subset of a much bigger data, data, data set. And it was very hard to work with that because it was a huge file extremely huge file and there are actually ways to deal with these kinds of files um, in a faster way and that's also part of the, that's also part of um, data science how do you deal with processing um, huge data sets that come like you know uh, for example you can just imagine how much data Google um, YouTube re um, receives not just in one go but like every second you have data coming in so how to process this is also part of data science. So anyway, going back to like what I uh, the TDRs that I'm working with, it's not that difficult because it's like a one thing data set. No, it's from two years and then it's done. Um, so what we want to know is what new insights can we get from a data set with um, this uh, rich information? So uh, we have this, um, we actually brainstormed a bit about this. Normally, that's how it works. So in this case, we have the data set and we, we want to know um, what can we learn from this data set? And we, were, we had to read papers to see what has already been done, um, what is already known, and we have to find some way to contribute to the knowledge of human behavior using um, what we have. And this data set is actually unique in the sense that we know not just the calling behavior, but also the location and the demographics and this tracking thing. So we kind of know what these people are doing for a long time. And that's why we decided to focus on what we call internal migration and how this affects or how this relates to mobile communication. What is internal migration? Uh, these are long distance um, residential moves within the same country. So for example, if you go, from anywhere from Luzon to Mindanao, that is definitely a long distance move. There is no way that you can commute every day, you know, from school to work. You know, you cannot just, unless you're very rich, you cannot, it's very hard to imagine someone who works in somewhere in Manila, for example, you know, and, and lives like in Visayas or Mindanao. It's too expensive. So normally when you move, you know, all your, your, so your life will change, whom you meet will change, you know, your daily routine will change. And, uh, this is expected, this has been known to, you know, or rather expected to be, to be disrupted, um, sorry, to disrupt your normal social life. Uh, this has been studied by sociologists um, in a number of ways, but as I will mention later, due to some limitations with conventional methods like surveys or census, they usually study only a particular group of people. For example, they want to study um, mothers living in poor areas in Metro Manila, as an example right? Or um, maybe farmers in Bukidnon, those kinds of things. Uh, 
you know, it, it, or, or teachers or high school teachers, very specific group of people um, who whom they're interested in for some reason. And and um, but what we have is we have a huge data set. We have a lot of information about different kinds of people, and we want to use this to study how does this internal migration affect the communication patterns between someone who moved and someone left behind. So, for example, you have um, you have this this, um, this person. This is a person of interest, and before moving. So this person was call, uh, was calling these four people uh, pretty often. Now, what happens if this person moves? The question is, okay, will this person still be close to these four people? Um, maybe for some, you know, it wouldn't change anything. Maybe for some, uh, for like this person, for example, the communication actually increased. But maybe for this person, you know, I mean, maybe it's goes away it just goes away um i'm so sorry who's writing on the yeah but anyway my point is that we want to address these questions first of all if you have a move will the communication frequency change after the move so does it mean that if someone moves you lose contact or maybe it could also be that you know the number of calls actually go up uh, or maybe it doesn't change at all um, and can we predict how it will change? So these are the questions that we actually address in our research, um, for, uh, in our research paper. There, of course, you can think of as many questions as, as as many you know research questions you can think of, and that's the nice thing about this data set. There is so rich that you can actually get so much information from it. But we are going to focus only on these two questions. So why can and why should we use CDRs to answer these questions? As I said earlier. The usual way to address this is to um, use surveys. So you know you have you and you have people, you have questionnaires, and they talk to people of interest. Ask them, okay, so when did you move? Where did you move? Whom did you talk to before moving? After moving? How close are you? And so, and so on. So the nice thing about these surveys is that they're very customized. You know, you have a question, a, a research question in mind. You can design the survey questions to answer exactly what you want. But they also have some disadvantages. The first one is that it's very expensive. Um, nowadays, it's a bit cheaper because you have online, you know, you can do it online. But even then, if you've worked in the social sciences, you know, it takes a lot of effort to talk to people, you know, convince them to answer your survey. And, and even then, you cannot always just get a lot of people, right? Sometimes, you know, you send this invites to everyone, then maybe, I don't know, maybe 50% respond. And if it's a longitudinal study, which is, for example, um, you need to track people. Let's say, let's say Adele, uh, she, um, I, I talked to her, let's say today, and I'll talk to her again next month and the following month. Maybe she'll get tired of answering my questions, so she'll just drop out of the study. So these things happen in real life. And that's one of the things that makes surveys um, kind of difficult to work with. Also, you have recall bias because it depends on whom you ask. If the respondent forgets, right? Okay, so that's that's a problem. And of course, you have a low temporal resolution. If I want to study call patterns, I cannot just call Adele every time and say, hey, did you call someone now or just a minute ago? It's, it's very difficult. So these are the problems with surveys. Now, these cons are actually addressed by CDRs because you have, I mean, you know exactly the time and whom this person is calling. And you have a lot of samples. But as I said, the data is gathered before you thought of the question. So you're kind of, if you, even if you wanted to know something, you cannot just redo the experiment. It's already there. So that's the thing but, uh, that you have to think about when you work with um, CDRs. So going back to this question, how do we study migration? Oh, what time is it? Am I going beyond? Okay, I think I have some time. Um, how do we study migration from the CDR data set? So remember that we have um, this, data right if you know the location and you know where 2132 is making calls for two years if 2132 actually move you should see a change in the location so from that you can actually infer who the movers are right and once you find the movers you can look at whom 2132 is calling um, and then you can do the same analysis for them because 1552 will appear somewhere here also in the list then you can check 
who among 213 those contacts stayed in the same location. So once you identify who these movers are and who these non-movers are, then you can you can actually like you know use the CDRs to study the question that we asked, which was what's the question? This one. We want to find the effect of internal migration on the communication between a mover and some other contact who was like you know who, who did not who stayed behind. Okay, so what we did, this is roughly a, a rough methodology. We use the location to check um, whether the person moved, and then we look at the call detail records to reveal their close contact. Uh, now, if you look at this, um, this is actually what I just said earlier, the first step involves um, data processing. So this is also a lot of work. It's very important. It's a lot of work, but it's kind of uh, not recognized that much. But I tell you, this is like, I don't know, maybe, 40%, 50%. So when you work with a large data set, you need a lot of cleaning, a lot of you know um, data wrangling. Uh, but eventually we got it. So we found the movers and we found their close contact. So we're interested in people whom you know you used to call frequently, regularly before you moved, because these people are most likely you know, close relationships, like maybe your parents, your friends, your significant other. And then once we have that, we want to find common patterns in how uh, these communication frequencies evolve after moving. And then we try to predict what happens after moving using information available before the move. Now, these two require machine learning techniques. Um, I won't discuss it in detail that much, but as you see here, it's like you, you kind of use um, math and computer science. Um, so first, we address a number of questions. Question zero, why is zero? It's, it's not really part of the question itself, but something we want to address to verify if we're getting the right data. So um, as you can see, uh, we have um, this age difference. So, so most of the users have an age gap of either less than 10 years or um, 20 to 40 years. And this is very interesting because you know you have it's not uniform. So you have a peak which corresponds to pairs where the age are roughly ages are roughly the same. These are likely friends or or you know boyfriend girlfriend, and then you have this age group, for example, where the mover is younger than um, the person left behind. So maybe these are what like you know a child moves to college or you know um, goes to work in some other city. The parent is in the hometown, and then you have these cult between the parents and you know the kids. And to some extent, you have um, something smaller here, which is, you know, the other way around. The parents move, and then they call their kids back in their hometown. And since we have these, you know, it, it kind of means that these strong ties that we look for are likely friends or family as expected. Uh, so now we have um, the question number one, which was we wanted to find common patterns of change in communication frequency. So it looks like this. Suppose that you have a moving month and you want to know how often does a pair communicate. And let's say for pair number one, it looks like this. So, you know, of course you, you have some fluctuations, but there's some general pattern. And maybe for pair number two, it looks like this one. So what we do, you have like a lot of these pairs, right? And we try to group them using what we call clustering method, uh, see which, which, which pairs have the same or similar behavior. So that's clustering. And what we found um, was that communication, first of all, communication rarely goes away. So even if you move, these strong ties actually will remain, but they may go up or they may go down. So um, this kinds of, uh, uh, this, uh, I'll, I can listen to this later if you have time, but. That's the point. Now, whenever you do these kinds of um, data science, you have to always refer back to domain knowledge. In this case, it's sociology. So every so often we try to compare what our findings are and how consistent or inconsistent they are with what are the currently known um, findings in sociology. So in sociology, they have found that, I mean, um, if we have strong ties, these ties tend to remain even after moving. And we find that it's consistent in the same way. I also wanted to point out that 
uh, we found that uh, movers and non uh, this is our pairs where someone moved. And these are pairs where um, someone did not move, and, and it's a bit different behavior. So I can discuss it later again um, uh, for some details. So the difference, though, between sociological studies and our studies is that we have a quantitative. We really know, like, how fast it drops or how big it drops. Not just, oh, it went down, it went up. We actually know these numbers, and that gives us a lot more information. The second one is, can we predict whether communication will rise or so? This is the same diagram I showed earlier, but I am now concerned with just these two. So once this person moves, the question is, will this pair actually, um, you know, what happens? Will it rise or decay? So to do that, we use what is called a classification model. So you have your data, and then you split them into what we call a train set and a test set. So the difference here is that the model is trained on the train set, but it doesn't see the test set. So that way you don't have what we call overfitting. So for example, if you, if you have a, like a series of, um, if you have a model that aims to predict um, something and you use the same model on the same data, of course it will give you a good idea. You know, it's, it's just like if I gave you an exam, uh, sorry, if I give you a reviewer, that's the same as the exam. Obviously, you know, you'll get 100%. Or maybe 90% if you forgot some things. But it's gonna give you excellent results. So what we do is that we give you a reviewer and then we give you an exam which is somewhat similar but not the same. So that's like the idea. So we have the input which is what we know about the users before they move. That is how often did they call before the move. We also know their age and gender and we also know you know how they move, the distance, the direction and so on. Now we input this to a model. Uh, again, I can look at it later if, if, if we need, if we have time, but if not, like just use it as like a, just a model, like so some, some black box thing. And then it gives you an output, did it rise or did it decay? And it's correct or not, because you know if it rose or decay, you just want to try to see, okay, did we predict it correctly? And then you see this, you look at this performance and then check, oh, okay, so, it's not, the performance is not very good. So we had to improve the model. And we have this feedback loop. You know, you, you use the output, get a better model and so on. Now, once you're done with that, you have what we call a trained model. And then you use the test set to, um, in the same information, but for a different, remember this is something that the model has not seen. So as I said in, in my earlier, uh, I said earlier, it's like a reviewer and an exam. The reviewer is not the same as the exam, but it's kind of similar. So that's like the idea that we have. And then we get the output, and this tells you how good the model is. So the result is that it turns out that pre-move calling behavior is the best predictor, um, followed by you know other things like direction of the move and age, but it's kind of more minor than that. It's mainly the pre-calling behavior. If you call often, Free move, we probably also call often post move and so on. So I have the, pa uh, the paper is on what we call archive. It's a repository of preprint papers so before publication. If you're interested, I can send you the link. But if not, I think this is a good overview of what we have done so far. So to summarize my talk, I just wanted to, um, uh, to like discuss again what we have discussed. Uh, first is, uh, you know, what, does a po what is a postdoc? Because people usually don't know um, what a postdoc is. So I just gave you an idea. It's just like, <coughs> sorry, you're just, you're, you're, it's just research training. That is, that is essentially what it is. And then complex systems and data science. Uh, how do we use call detail records to extract meaningful information? And in particular, in our use case, how we use these to gain um, insight on uh, migration and communication patterns. So um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions uh, about this or something else related, then please let me know. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, um, Dr. Fadoli for joining us today. Um, I am Adele, and I'll be taking over the position of Professor Sherwin today as the moderator for this session. Um, we would just like to congratulate him and his wife for the birth of their child earlier today. So we wish them good health and joy. 
And um, today, we are so privileged to have Dr. Fadoli with us. And it was a wonderful, actually, it's an interesting um, research because it is a conjunction of different fields. You have your computational physics, for example, or you have your uh, social sciences. So I know that um, we are all excited to learn more from you, Dr. Fadoli, through the interactions that you'll have with the participants. So I'd just like to encourage everyone to ask your questions directly to our speaker. Um, by this, you may click the raise hand icon and only when we acknowledge you, we will unmute your microphone. So we encourage you also to state your name first and then your affiliation. If your signal is unstable, you may also write your questions in the chat box and uh, I will read them for you. So I guess we are now open for, for questions. And uh, while we are waiting for everyone to prepare their questions, I probably go with a basic question because most of the participants are students. So mm -hmm. if you're a student and um, you want to pursue this kind of research, what are the core subjects or skills that you have to develop or you know strengthen the understanding of? Okay, so um, if you want to work on uh, data science in particular, I would highly recommend that you um, take classes in statistics because these will really help you, you know, understand how to work with data. And actually, even if you don't want to work on data science, I mean, if you work with some data, it's good to know, you know, which models you can use and which data, what are the limitations and, and, and so on. So that's something that I would absolutely recommend everyone to take. Uh, for complex systems, uh, the field is a lot, but I would say bigger because there are many different kinds of complex systems. So it really depends on what you want to study. If you want to study on complex networks, um, network science, so if you want to work on, you know, um, uh, have I showed these networks, right? Uh, math is always a good thing to know. Um, but usually, you what, what we do, so, so here's the thing. Um, in research, and this is something I really want to emphasize, you have to think about it not as you're learning this particular topic, but you are learning skills which are important to study this particular area. Because if you focus on skills, that means that you can actually use the same skills to study other things. So for example, in my case, I have worked on I have worked on different things, but each time, you know, the skills that I learn, they are kind of transferable from like one field to another. So to give an example, um, at EDC, I was working with um, geophysicists and most of my work was like on programming, which I vowed never to do back then. But I somehow ended up doing that and now it's very useful in what I do, which is completely unrelated. Um, uh, also, you know, I mean, just, just make sure that whatever skills you learn, they're like, they would help you develop as a researcher or outside academia even. So yeah, but definitely statistics. That's very important. Okay, thank you for sharing that one, um, Dr. Fadoli. Mm -hmm. I'd like now to go through the questions of our participants. Okay. We'll start with Alas Kayong. I don't know if that is the correct name. Um, is there any possibility that an individual can entirely remove or delete his or her data traces? Yeah, so actually, especially now um, with all these scandals, um, if you notice, you have to read your privacy statement very carefully. And sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, take it all or get out. Sometimes it's like that. And you have to make a decision, you know, whether are you really willing to risk your privacy, you know, in this way. But also, sometimes it, it may not really affect you in that much. Like, um, you know, all these anonymous uh, data, if you think you don't mind, go for it. But read that if you're very concerned about privacy, read it very carefully, you know, and, and all, I, I, so what I, um, for me, for example, I always think that whatever I upload online, these are things which, you know, you, you upload with knowing the risks. Like if you have very private things to say, if it's out there, it's hard to take it back. You have people doing screenshots or whatever. So just be careful with what you share, I guess, online. But Privacy, I mean, if you're concerned about that, just look at the privacy settings and look for reviews. Um, some people probably have done it for you. So, yes. Okay, um, I'd like to call on Mike. Uh, Mr. Von Philip Perez to ask the question directly. 
Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How, how does the data, data private, ano, protect data privacy act? What is that? Data ah, privacy act. Data privacy act. So actually, I um, saw that it... in in the Google Google Forms. Or when I was when I'm registering from webinars because I and right now because of our situation I'm joining webinars mm. like this. what is data privacy act so actually it's a uh, there are many data privacy acts all over like all over the world and each country has a unique version of the law but essentially what it does is it, it tries to protect you as a user from you know sharing data which you don't want to share so for example, um, they require the companies to be very honest about, you know, which data are we going to use, what we're going to use it for, and once they stop needing data, they have to delete it. So there are safeguards. Uh, if you want more details about that, you can consult the um, National Privacy Commission um, in the Philippines. Uh, or you can, you know, ask, so I, I'm not a lawyer, I passed law school, but I didn't push through with it. So you can ask someone who studies law and specifically on how these laws were constructed to protect your privacy. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Um, I would like also to encourage everyone to raise your questions directly to Dr. Fodoli. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to interact with her. So um, I encourage you to click the raise hand icon. Okay, yeah. also I, I, I got a private message. So this is a question, I, I don't think you can see this. So um, this is from Huawei DRA LX5. I think this is the, the phone use. So. Since it is possible to track down the most likely activity of a group or someone, why is it still hard to work with low internet connection? Um, so actually, this is not really part of data science. Uh, in terms of internet connection, you know, Philippines is very bad in that aspect, but it's mainly a hardware thing. So hardware um, and how to improve that and politics is also a big part of it. So I don't want to go into that. But in terms of how this relates to like data gathering in the Philippines. So just an example, I work in Korea and the reason why the government has been able to handle COVID very well is because of these traces. So they could track people, you know, if you are infected, they, they know where you went because they have GPS records. Um, they have credit card records, they have CCTVs. So if you know where an infected person goes, you now there is no way this person can lie and you can really isolate them before the infection spreads. Now in the Philippines, this kind of thing is almost impossible. It's not impossible because, you know, we have technology wise, we haven't really invested in this and our privacy laws are much stronger. So you cannot just release someone's information like, you know, to the public, whereas they do here in Korea. So that's like one implication of um, the lack of technology in the Philippines in this case. So privacy, I mean, losing privacy is not always bad. Sometimes, like in the case of Korea, it's a necessary evil. So, yes, it works sometimes. Okay, I have another question from Mr. Jovest Matt Tatli. Um, mm -hmm. If you are using CDR, wouldn't that be susceptible to external disturbances like natural calamities or human activities hacked or... Actually, Yes, actually, yes. So some people have studied this. Like when there's an earthquake, you know, you expect like a sudden rise, for example, in calls from one particular location to another. So they have studied this, like what happens to CDRs and it's, it's another subfield. And it was also very interesting. So yes, it can. Um, in this case, though, uh, what, what we had, the country didn't really have any particular, you know, event during that time, major event. And we were taking it over two years and we averaged over each month. So unless there was like a long-term thing, like, you know, like a drought or something or, or, or a war, it wouldn't really affect, I mean, those small things wouldn't really affect the data. So uh, if you want, we can discuss it like in more detail, like how we try to course re remove all these um, possible uncertainties, but yes, those have been taken into account. Okay, this one is from Professor Albilan Bello of Bukidnon State University. Um, I would just like to ask whether CDRs could handle qualitative data in lieu of quantitative. I am referring to the research, uh, recent trends in education research where we use qualitative tools to triangulate quantitative data. So I'm not really very sure exactly. I mean, it depends, of course, on the problem. But yes, a machine learning also works with um, qualitative data as well. So there are ways to kind of convert this into something which models can work. Uh, 
which models can um, use or, or can be used for. So yes, it is definitely possible, but again, it depends on the actual data that you have. So once you, so each problem deserves you know, its own study and you have to like decide which tools to use, like depending on what you want to know. Mm -hmm. From Dr. Jose Antolan, um, he is asking, I think this question resonates also from the questions of most of the students who are participating here. Uh, I'm just a little bit curious, how young were you when you realized that you are into science, particularly physics? And who are your inspirations in physics? Um, so actually, uh, my, my mom was a biologist. And so when I was younger, like we would grow plants, all these things, have experiments where you grow mungo. So for example, in one box, if you cover the box, in one box, you, you know, sorry, not a box, you just leave it exposed to sunlight. You water each plant every day, you know, you have the same number of mungo seeds. And at the end of it, you try to measure how long these plants were. And I was very young back then, maybe like four or three or five. So these kinds of, like, you know, these experiments kind of made me more interested in science. I'm not particularly physics, physics came later. But to be honest, actually, I'm not, I, I'm more into, as I said, interdisciplinary things. So kind of just using the math that I learned in physics um, to, to, un, to, to answer like different other questions. So yes, I would say science like very young because also of my background, but physics like much, much later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, about complex systems, is there any improvement on using chaos theory on predicting many variables? Ah, what do you mean by improvement? So if you're talking about, I haven't really followed chaos theory um, that much. As I said, complex is a big thing. I work usually on network science and data science. Uh, but there, if, if you want to know, I mean, there are, this is still an active field of research. So there are some papers, I just don't know exactly how to answer your question on improve, what, what do you mean improvement on using chaos theory? So yes, um, there are, it's still an ongoing, like still an active research field, but I just don't know exactly how to address your particular question. Okay, from Ms. Julian Punzal, can studying data science lead to a successful career path in stock trading or in stock market? Okay, actually, that's the thing about data science. So nowadays, as I said, it's about the skill really. So for example, if I worked um, with CDRs, I don't have to find a job which only works with CDRs. I can find a job which requires me to use the same knowledge or the same skills that I learned while doing this. So for example, if that's like predicting the stock market, then the answer is, well, my I think for that, I would need a little more than what I've used. So I, I, I also have a um, physics background, so they also use these techniques. The answer, short answer is yes, but you always have to know that you cannot stop studying. You, know, you cannot just study and then stop. Um, working in stuff involving any kind of data, if you want to you know, be flexible, you have, to, you have to be willing to learn new things. So if you want to go into stock trading, then you have to be willing to learn the tools that they use which is not impossible, but you still have to learn it. So, so yes, the answer is yes, just with a little bit more effort. Okay, another one is from Rit Vincent Librado. Um, hi, Dr. Fodoling. I would like to ask your opinion regarding very large data sets. For example, as we go into the Internet of Things, this would entail more complex data systems. Mm -hmm. Make data acquisition and classification simpler or more complex. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Okay. Um, regarding very large data sets, right, right. as we go into the Internet of Things, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. entail more complex data systems. Yes. Make data acquisition and classification simpler or more complex? Oh, yeah. So actually, this is the thing. Um, the reason why big data has become a thing recently is that before it was impossible. So in order to analyze big data, you need to have a lot of hardware that can analyze it. You need to have a lot of storage space, a lot of memory. And these improvements in computer engineering, you know, and material science, um, how you can create, you know, much more storage space in like, you know, a, co a compact hard disk. Um, these things matter. And how can you make these um, cheap and, re and reliable? For example, before, if you wanted to do Neural networks, it takes forever. 
But now if you have cloud computing, you have this, all these architectures, it's now more manageable, you know, to, 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 to like work on these projects. And that's actually um, um, something that people tend to forget that the advances in data science is actually due to advances in hardware and engineering. Um, so whether it, so of course it makes it more complex in a sense of that working with millions, billions, you know, trillions of, 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 of rows or even unstructured data requires a lot more computing power than working with an Excel spreadsheet, right? Um, at the same time, though, this advanced in technology also allows us to, you know, deal with this data in a better way. So in a sense, I would say that it is more complex, but that we also try to look for ways to deal with it. So I hope that answers um, this question. Mm -hmm. I'd like to combine the questions of Ms. Alea Rian and Ms. Mary Grace Arnaiz because they are somewhat um, similar. So nowadays, we are into online learning and we require students to change their account names into real names. Mm -hmm. Some insisted that it's a threat to their privacy as what they have learned in their MIL. Is that really a threat? Ah, again, as I said, it depends on what you want to use it for. So, um, like for example, um, <clears throat> using your name on Facebook, using your real name on Facebook. If you actually look at Facebook's um, terms and conditions, they require that you actually use your real name and they require that you only use one account per person, not one account per email, one account per person. So if you have a duplicate account, you know, a second account, technically it violates your terms and conditions. So that is why recently, um, before it wasn't a big deal, but with, with you know, all these things of disinformation spreading, Facebook has been doing a lot of things to try to remove bot accounts, you know, or, or troll accounts. Um, so I would say that, again, only release information that you are willing to risk to some extent or things that you really have to use. Now, uh, like for example, in Zoom, there has been this issue of, you know, um, was it, uh, I forgot, vandalism, something like that. So people just entering, you know, uh, interrupting the meeting and they have tried to like have security measures, but it's always a good thing to, to like think of that. Whatever you share online, just share what you're willing to risk sharing. That's all. Yeah, um, in terms of student-friendly language tool, useful for honing skills in data science as preparatory for computing big-scale data, mm -hmm. recommend as a student-friendly language tool. Ah, uh, you mean computing language? I mean programming language. Definitely Python. Mm -hmm. Python. Um, I have my first the first programming language I used was C plus plus way back in college, and it was a really bad experience because C plus plus requires a lot of things that you're normally not very used to. But Python is clear, you know, it's 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 more like it's very easy compared to all the other languages. And not just that, if you're interested in data science, it has libraries which you can just import and let it do the work for you. So I would really recommend um, Python if you're going to work in more classical statistics then R is a better fit. But if you want to work in machine learning, I would definitely suggest um, um, starting with Python. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this one is from the president of the St Physics Student Society of Western Mindanao State University. Mm -hmm. um, good day, Dr. Fodoli. You have mentioned earlier about a research conducted that is similar with your study. Where mm -hmm. are the results obtained by your team similar to the one in that related study? So you mean a sociology study? Oh, so, so, so first, so um, I think I also mentioned one, and that's a sociology one, right? The thing about sociology is that they, again, they look at small like studies. For example, they look at Canadians in this age bracket who move from this city to this city in this like time frame, and it's kind of I wouldn't say it's it's like a reproduction because we didn't really exactly reproduce their experiment. What we have though are results that are consistent with what they found. So we have a quantitative result. They have more like a qualitative result. You know, they ask people, you know, they, they ask, okay, who, whom did you contact? Whom uh, did you start calling them after some time? So it's different. But um, in that sense, they are kind of consistent. I wouldn't say similar, but consistent. Regarding CDRs, there are also a number of other studies um, doing, and there are so many, but 
our data set is unique because it has all these things. It has location, demographics, and the uh, call pattern. So um, that's why uh, this particular uh, work is, is unique in that sense. So this has all this information. Okay, um, we'd like to go into the last two questions since we have the time. Okay, last three questions. Okay, we'll have first with Mr. Sidney Sidoro. Can you give us some things or tips on how to deal how to deal with big data po in order for us to be overwhelmed when dealing with that? Okay, big data. First of all, do not use Excel. Number one rule. There actually was this recent um, news article about, I think it was in the UK, that they miss 16,000 cases because the Excel file is only up to 64,000 cases, right? And it stopped updating. So, you know, if you're working with big data, you have to think about what kind of, um, how am I going to store my data in the first place? So, some people think that storing it in text files is better, but actually, if you're working with big data, I think it's best to work with databases. Mm -hmm. So, SQL um, and and similar um, file systems. So if you're going to read big data, I, I suggest learn how to use SQL um, um, because it's going to be extremely useful. Okay, um, what about those people who change their SIM numbers or social media accounts and such, but still continue on talking to a specific person? Would it be considered as they stop communicating or they get uh, a, a new identity? So actually, in again, as I said, we have millions of subscribers, but we made a number of filters to account for this. So in this case, if the person stop, you know, using this number, then uh, so these are all postpaid accounts, by the way. What we have, um, because we know their genders and ages, these only come from the contract information. So everyone, you know, is is in a contract, and we only looked at people who were active from for two entire years. And that makes these scenarios um, um, more unlikely. So again, as I said, data is garbage unless you know how to deal with it. And a lot of a lot of times, you have to look at what you want to know, and then look at the data and see which of this can you use, which of this you should not use, and which of this you know you may be able to work with. So for a particular question, as far as our question, our research is concerned, those cases are not included. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll probably wrap up this um, question and answer portion with two questions. First is from Sean Roy Tarabe. This is, uh, I think, a good question that resonates from most of the students here. Number one is, what do you love about what you do? Ah, what about what? So for me, I really enjoy um, working with uh, learning new things and, and learning new skills. If I am just recycling what I learned. I don't learn anything new. It doesn't work for me. So when I began um, working on cold data records, I absolutely have never handled data my entire life, much less like big data sets. So it was like, okay, I have to learn how to, you know, how to work with with data sets, um, the databases also. So I had to learn how to do coding properly, how to make my codes run fast. Um, because all of these things, again, these are like minor, these seem to be minor things. And if you read the paper, they're not there. Like I did this and that and this and that, you know, try to fix my code, there's a bug. It's not in the paper, but it's actually a huge part of the process. So learning how to work with big data was something that I really enjoyed, as well as learning on all the machine learning techniques. I also learned them while I was here. So before this, I, I, I knew absolutely zero about this thing. That's what I'm saying. If you you have to be flexible, if you want to have flexibility, you have to be willing to learn um, new things and understand that it's not about what you do, but what you can do rather um, with what you have learned. So I guess that's for me is the most fun. I think we'll go through the last question. What advice could you give to students who are particularly struggling with physics? Ah, it will pass. I mean, <laughs> So for example, like I, I, um, I guess many of us can relate to this. Um, so I also said, um, I worked as a, as a, I also used to teach physics too. But at some point like um, in your life, you just kind of like, you just kind of realize that it's just a small like aspect of life in general, even professional life. So what I do now, 
none of it is exactly the same as so i would say in five years in physics maybe i'm only using i don't know um little percentage of what i actually learned but the skills that i that i had like you know math um rigor uh, these softs are not soft skills but more like these skills can also be translated into working in other fields so i would say um if you're talking with physics I, I would definitely ask you how is your math because if you don't if you're struggling with math then maybe that's the thing you should work on but if you just you know if you just hate the th hate physics Here's my advice. Um, it doesn't matter how old you are, there will be things which you will hate absolutely, but you have to get, you know, you have to go through it. And fortunately for you, if you pass physics, you will have the option not to take it ever in your entire life. So, you know, just, you know, try to get it over and done with and, you know, hope maybe like in my case, I said to myself in college, I'll never do programming again, but where, what am I doing now? So sometimes these things happen. Maybe you'll be a physics professor in the future. You never know. So just, you know, just, just um, try to, you know, just don't stop, you know, don't give up and, and try to deal with it in smaller problems, a, a smaller problems rather, break it down. Well, that's what I would advise. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Fodoni. Can we give a virtual round of applause to our speaker? Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for coming. So much. And thank you also to all of those who raised their questions. And I know that you still have a lot of questions in mind, but um, hopefully you can join us um, later on in our networking short networking so that you can interact more with Dr. Podoli. Um, I'd like to give this opportunity to, Mr., uh, to Professor Neil Alfie Lasta, who will give his reaction or his response to your talk. So, Professor Neil, if you're here. Hi, Adele. Can you hear me? Uh, before I give my response, I would like to congratulate the uh, Bukid Non-Physics Society and um, maybe the Earth Shakers and all other societies in Mindanao for um, holding this successful event. And um, I am a witness to what you started with and how you grew. And now you're inviting Dr. Fudolik. And um, Dr. Fudolik, I would just like to say that, like, when we first heard about you, you were 16 years old and you graduated um, summa cum laude in UP Diliman. I was a college student, I guess, Adele, or are we, we were we taking up our master's back then? Probably college students, and we were like, whoa. And because of that reaction, your name, Mikaela Irene Fudoli, that really, I know that name for 11 years now, and for the first time I heard that name, I never forgot about it again. And because that it was just that awesome for you to be so young and to be uh, summa cum laude and uh, valedictorian in UP Diliman. Now, now I took some notes and um, my notes is a data mess and I may need your expertise to organize and make something out of this. But, um, first of all, I would like to say, um, Dr. Fudolig, that um, hmm, I remember your interview with a newspaper wherein I think the newspaper um, asked you uh, what your secret is to success in physics and I think you mentioned that um, kinukulit mo talaga yung professors mo if you have something that you don't understand then you keep on asking and asking until you understand and that resonated with me because that's something that I don't do and um, it really um, made me think about uh, what I'm doing and how I can, because I'm now a teacher, how I can convince my students to do the same thing that you do and that is to um, nurture your curiosity. And so as I remember that um, interview, and um, please uh, correct me if, if that didn't happen, or, but I think that's what happened. You had this interview and you said that kinukulit mo ang professor mo and that really it's, true. It's, true. <laughs> it's true. Is, is it true? Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. I think my, my later on, my, my, my person would tell me that they, I gave him a hard time because I would ask too many questions. And when I also started to teach, there were also students like me. And then I, I understood like what I yeah. was doing to my professors. But, you know, it's kind of nice anyway to see all these students who are willing to learn. And yeah. 
they also help you as like a professor to you know you you can't stop just here you have to make sure that you learn more you know and it's not like once you're a professor you've done you're done learning you know you have to keep on studying keep on learning new things and yeah that story i tried to connect it with um this response that i'm about to give you and i was uh um, a little bit afraid baka hindi ko ma-connect yung story na yan sa response ko ngayon but as it turns out it's everywhere in everything that you said curiosity is deep seated for example you dived into complex systems and i'm pretty sure you're very curious about uh, um, just the mere act of studying and physics and science in general um, has something to, to do with curiosity and a uh, desire to learn knowing the nitty-gritty details. Uh, you're working with mobile phone data, and uh, as I was looking, to be honest, as I was looking at the table that you posted, it's really boring because it doesn't have any names, just um, these codes and this, uh, yes, um, where they are, where they went, and don't you just wish you knew a little bit more? But um, it takes a bit of curiosity and a desire to learn to work with that data, loads of data you mentioned that. You also mentioned that you had to code, which is something you didn't like doing in the past. And because of your curiosity, you did it. And then look where you are right now. You are a very successful postdoc and you are an inspiration to many. And, um, you know, I'm just looking through my notes and it's really uh, a data garbage and I don't know how to organize this, but really, um, in relation to you asking loads of questions back when you were an undergrad student, um, I connected what you said in this talk that asking a set, asking a that seems to have an obvious answer, but using science to garner surprising results. What I mean is um, that sociology study that seemed to already have the answer um, through surveys, but you you tried to ask another uh, similar question anyway, but this time. Um, uh, with the rigor of mathematics and to have uh, quantitative data. And what else can I say? This is this has been you have been a blessing to our society. I mean our community. And I'm very grateful to have this part in. This is the first time that Adele Adele is my classmate in college, by the way. First time that Adele asked me to respond. Well, she asked me a few speakers back. But when I found out that it was you, I didn't hesitate and um, decided to give my time because uh, I, I hope I'm not sounding like a fan, but um, I'm a huge fan. So thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, uh, Dr. Fudali, would you like to respond? Did you respond? <laughs> <laughs> I just like want to say like thank you very much for that response um and uh as i said before like i hope that this talk kind of encourages people you know to work on data science too because there's a huge demand um in this and uh, if it is a good thing to to like you know study if you are kind of i mean some of you are physics or working on physics and if you want something where i don't, I don't really know what i want to do in the future with this kind of thing if you work with data it's a skill which you can translate like to other things in the future. So I would highly recommend, um, you know, it's not going to be a waste of your time. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Fadoli. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn this over now to our MC, David. Oh, sorry, I forgot to unmute my mic. Okay, thank you, Dr. Fadoli, for that wonderful talk and also, um, Professor Adele for moderating the session, the Q and A session, and Professor Neil Lasta for giving us the response. Now we will welcome uh, Professor Bien Botanas, the chair of the physics department of CMU, for the closing remarks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hinayon. Uh, we are so happy that uh, we are joined by several several uh, uh, partners, like uh, I'd like to mention uh, Pinoy scientists, uh, Earth, Earth uh, Shaker, the Western Mindanao State University Physics Department, 
the CMU Science Education Society, the Department of Physics Society of student, uh, Physics Students in uh, MSU Marawi, and then the Kapisana ng mga mag-aaral sa Fisika, Caraga State University Physics Department, the University of Science and Technology of Southern Philippines Physics Department, the uh, CMU Physics Society, and the Bukidnon Physics Society. So, as you can as you can see, uh, we are we are uh, uh, gaining much uh, participants from from Mindanao, and we were uh, we are very happy that uh, students are actually supporting us, and then. These students are actually inspired by our speakers. And as you can see in my background, I'd like to thank them, the, the uh, volunteers. Uh, if, if not for them, uh, this meetup would not be possible. And then uh, Adele is actually working so hard to, uh, to invite more volunteers. And as, as you can see, um, uh, I'm happy that uh, Mr. Hinayon and other presidents of different societies in the different organization, physics organization in Mindanao are actually uh, joining us. Also, uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Mikaela Pudoli for, uh, for gracing us, for, for giving in, uh, inspiration to our, to our uh, participants. They are actually, uh, most of them are actually uh, physics students and then uh, somewhat from from what you've discussed, they yeah you have given them a glimpse of uh, the future that uh, they might be uh, pursuing or doing later on, and so uh, thank you for that. And then uh, I would like to thank also uh, Professor Neil uh, Lasta. So Kuya uh, Neil, if you are if you are if you are listening, dili kayo ka fanatic. But then, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for uh, joining us. And also, I'd like to thank uh, uh, May, uh, Mavel uh, Dikiso for, for allowing us to uh, use her uh, Zoom account. So hopefully, uh, please, I'm inviting you to please uh, support the organization. And let's uh, make physics and science uh, more um, more uh, enticing to young to the young to the young ones that would be all thank you thank you sir bien now we would like to invite everyone to open their cameras if you are comfortable of course for a group picture we will have uh siguro mga three poses okay is everyone ready so i'll, I'll wait for a bit Okay, so ready na? Ready? So let's start in three, two, one. Smile. Okay, so strike another pose in three, two, one. Smile. And for this last one, uh, may I request, request everyone? So after ng countdown call, let's all say physics meet up. Okay, so three, two, one. Physics meet up. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, once again, we are glad to have all of you here in our physics meet up session today. We will be giving the certificates after you have accomplished the feedback form, where you can also write your messages for our dear speaker. Thank you and see you in the next session of the physics meet up. Thank you, everyone.